The, the next, uh, I mean, uh, Dr. J.K. Reddy, uh, unfortunately, uh, could not be here, but uh, his presentation uh, uh, will be uh, done by uh, Dr. Umesh. Uh, uh, it'll be on improving patient satisfaction, management of dry A and dysphotopsia. Yeah, thank you, Srini. Uh, dry A, I think, now has become very common. And I would like to spend a few slides on the classification of dry A. All these years, we were getting very confused and bombarded with the various classification protocols. Um, at last, uh, the Asia Dry Eye uh, Society, the DUS1, DUS2 is now gone. Now they have come up with this new uh, uh, classification based on the instability of the tear film and the amount of ocular surface damage. Luckily, with, with this, you don't need any fancy instruments and all these things, including osmolality and all these things, they are classifying uh, dry eye based on the trier film breakup patterns. If you see here, I mean, this is just the beginning. We are just starting to, to see this. I think all of us must start looking at it. All it needs is a fluorescent strip and 10 seconds of us to observe the blink patterns. And you see the blink patterns. If you see a area breakup or a line breakup, it is aqueous deficiency. A spot breakup or a dimple breakup, you know, it's mucin deficiency. And a random break is lipid deficiency. And that's when correlated cl clinically, uh, especially with the uh, uh, presence of MGD or, you know, your other dry eye syndromes. So you, uh, the manner, classification much much busier. So now at last there is some sanity in the classification. But important is that we have to get used to the blink patterns. It's not so easy. I'm sure over a period of time, we'll all get used to all these things. And you know, when you know that it's an aqueous deficiency, you use your regular HPMC, CMCs. The uh, mucin, you have newer drugs, ribapamide and uh, your diaquasols. And the lipid deficiency, of course, the more viscous ones like uh, sodium hyaluronate, your um, uh, polyglycol and HPGAR and all these things. So at least there is some classification as to you what you're using rather than what the uh, representative tells you. So with this uh, preoperative planning, it is important, imperative that you optimize the surface. First you identify what is the type of deficiency and then optimize because it's very important. If it's severely dry, you will end up in miscalculations in the IOL, especially toric and ultimately uh, and multifocals, especially those who are doing plenty of multifocal, multifocals, I for one, do a complete dry examination as part of a routine multifocal workup. So make sure that you're going to do that. The, it is very, very, very well proven beyond though that surgery itself causes dry eye to some extent. That is by repeated drying irrigation. The eye drops, the biggest culprit is the back, that is the benzalkylum chloride. And the phototoxicity, especially people doing topical nowadays, the surgical trauma and of course the incisional nerve damage. So along with that, a pre-existing, so it's better you optimize. The ACRS uh, clinical recommendations has asked us to thoroughly look into all these things they've given. Uh, at the end of the day, I think uh, it is our clinical perspective that uh, what we do. So look at the MGDs, mainly at the MGDs and the leads, and any abnormalities in the leads will go a long way, including our good old Oroplus and all those things will go a long way in managing the pre-existing DEDs. And, uh, uh, practical tips to manage dry eye disease is, uh, Dr. Bhumanathi uh, clearly told us about the NSAIDs avoiding in all these things. BAK, the biggest culprit, use as much as uh, benzalkylum free uh, containing drops, we'll discuss about it. Uh, artificial tears, obviously, and uh, pre-op uh, antibiotics for any uh, intra-operatively. Uh, uh, they, they do insist that you continue with the two-step pyridine because that is proven beyond doubt that it is a b the best antimicrobial prophylaxis. Limit the amount of anesthetic drops that we discussed because it causes a surface uh, damage epithelial toxicity. Limit the amount of mediatic drops. So probably you can go more into intracamerals if you are, have the habit of microscope light exposure, large corneal incisions, uh, question, questionable flax again in their questioning. Limit the thermal energy delivered, uh, optimize your uh, phacodynamics, use the uh, uh, remaining viscoelastic on the cornea at the end of the surgery that mostly for all surgeries we are doing and be cautious with the multifocal that we discussed. The so post-operatively, obviously, uh, the NSAIDs are advised and more the um, epithelial toxics like the amino glycoside, all those have been 
and follow up of DED. Many times we see that after one month or two months, they come back to you after three months, four months because they would have stopped the dry eye treatment. Make sure that you go ahead with this and increase the frequency of follow-up. See, the post-operative protocol that I follow is essentially Vigamax, no financial interest, but that's the only preservative-free drug that we have now. And I prefer Dexam, Madam told Dexamethasone is a better drug because that's not a suspension, it's clear. And most importantly, if you look at the um, uh, preservative, it is not, it doesn't have BAK, it has a, uh, chloride, chloronitrite, that is the preservative, and is more epithelial friendly, both the dexamethasone and the uh, preservative is more uh, friendly, so I prefer dexamethasone, uh, dexorinase, that is the, uh, this one, along with, uh, so this is the least amount of BAK that, that you can actually use post-operatively. And for those severe cases where the shearmers is less than fine, especially the aqueous deficiency, though the recommendation is to go for a um, uh, scleral punctum plugs, I don't believe in that because that itself will cost you 10, 12,000 and most importantly, uh, the starts protruding and gives a very uh, bad post-operative uh, touch and all those things. So I, we do the simple uh, Bowman scottery with a Bowman scotter or here we are using the radio frequency, simple one one punctum closure on table that goes a long way in, in at least uh, using the uh, residual uh, tears. So that is about the this one. I'll be talking about the dysphotopsias. Now, dysphotopsias has now slowly entering into all our practices. At one point, we were all thinking that a best uh, clear cornea, eye oil in the black, round rexis. We have given the basic six vision. We have, the patient comes back to you and telling you that he has some side vision problem, some blind spot on the temporal side. So, and it only seems to happen in people who have perfect surgery. So now all those, all your life you end up uh, training this and suddenly now you have to deal with this. Many of these patients, you know, you have done the best and no, nothing best, uh, best can be done beyond this. They come and they are very incredibly happy in telling that I have something here, something is there. So uh, now, now all of you who are doing the perfect surgeries, uh, you shouldn't start dealing with them. Uh, how to manage these people. Uh, yes, they are the negative dysphotopsias and the positive dysphotopsias. The positive somehow luckily are uh, uh, short living. Uh, they just have some glare, halos, only in a few patients. Persists uh, in some people, but uh, many people, how there is, looks like there will be some neural adaptation and patient gets uh, this one and gets used to it. And if you look at the actual uh, cause for it, it is because of the total internal reflection at the periphery. So that is the positive. Um, so whereas coming to negative, because we are not bothered, because most of them, once you give some sort of an assurance, they go back. But the negative disorders is now slowly creating a lot of problems. This is a typical, uh, this is the diagram what the patient has described that he sees temporarily this arc and um, um, restriction, they are telling. 6-6 six, six vision, very good, everything is good and you will have to s spend more chair time in trying to convince them about what this is and what this is not. Uh, it happens in the first visit only and somehow the patients are not happy because you are telling them it's the best and they are telling that they are not happy. So that is where you need to spend more chair time and try to ex and explain to them. And here what essentially happens is in the periphery there are two types of blind spots that are happening, zone one, zone two, zone three. There is zone three which goes at the periphery from the posterior and the square edge is where it uh, is get distracted here and forms the blind spot. So the nasal rays which falls on the, um, uh, the temporal rays which falls on the nasal, many uh, theories have been given by the pioneers, Samuel Maskett, Holiday, everybody, they've been looking at it because they are the first to highlight this problem. And uh, the causes were, um, we, we, we started telling them because we made an incision here, section edema, but the culprit looks like is the more of the optics of the IOL, Position, uh, posterior position, the more posterior, because I'm sure many of you would be using the hydrophilic lenses or the rigid lenses where the air constant is 118 or, or the ACA levels. None of them complain of any of this. So it's more of the vault, the posterior position, which exposes the, the temporal uh, uh, retina and the more anterior position of the uh, temporal uh, uh, retina. The most important thing is that what Musket explained is 
it will occur only with any lens that is well placed well within the blank which is the must that all of us have been trained and doing all our lives we learnt all our lives so, so luckily most cases do fade away so what Muscati said was anything that will block the source of light on the temporal side like a pair of spectacles will reduce so I think all of you must start giving them wear some sunglasses and these are the typical sunglasses that you must Probably he must be having that, I don't know. <laughs> so the treatment is uh, Muscati. What he said was, uh, this is the nasal, uh, this one, a capsule. So do a YAG exactly there. But the symptoms were not um, reducing. He said that patients are happy, patients are happy. Whether it was because of that or the pr patients got adapted, we don't know. Piggyback oil, reverse optic capture, bag in the lens, I think. Uh, the uh, germ uh, Swedish lady, uh, I think, bag in the lens eye oil. I don't remember her name. And then, then obviously the eye oil exchange. I think all these are uh, uh, are pretty um, very vague thing that we have to do, especially when you know that you've done the best surgery. So all of us are now looking at uh, looking at eye oil designs. So where is the problem? The problem is we have to eliminate the gap between the pupil iris and the eye oil. How? Either by increasing the size of the oil or designing the optics. That is what we are also looking at. We are doing a few studies. Some of the newer IOL, this is the Muscatis IOL, which has received FDA approval as of now. The optic has a, a small groove here, exactly there, where the anterior capsule has to be fixed so that the anterior capsule is slightly pushed more anteriorly, and that will prevent some amount of temporal uh, dysphotopsia. There is one by the Rupchen, I think this is the Indian version where the, he's increased the horizontal diameter of the um, lens. And this is, I think, Sri Ganesha sits an hydrophilic lens with some side uh, swiveled uh, optics which he lifts and puts on the anterior capsule so that the, uh, the lens essentially comes forward and blocks the nasal uh, uh, cells, nasal uh, ray, ray of lights. Now, what we are also looking at at our center is we are trying to look at uh, the trying to make the 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 regular lens are usually by con convex lens so what we are trying to do is make the periphery the center is by convex and the periphery concave so that the rays of light avoid the blind spot and this is exactly if you can see here this is the regular lens by convex we are making the periphery by concave so the rays of light instead of going there go there and avoid making the blind spot in and uh, we are actually started a few cases and we are patent pending. And this is one of the such lenses that we have started using. But essentially it's a hydrophilic lens as of now. And with a central uh, hydro, uh, central biconvex with a peripheral concave. I think going forward, if you really want to uh, avoid this neg negative dysphotopsia, some eye oil designing factor has to come otherwise it's very difficult uh, difficult to manage these uh, either they get adjusted or they stop coming to you because you start charging them more so either of it so uh, thank you thank you once again